right, welcome. I am Ellen Hardigan O'Connor from the History Department here at Davis, and I want to welcome you all to our second uh, session. Uh, the first was Big Data Measuring Us. Uh, our topic right now is Technology Changing Us. So we have three distinguished speakers who will be talking on this theme, and uh, each will give a presentation, then we'll have time afterwards for questions and comments. I'm going to introduce each one uh, before he or she speaks. So we're going to begin with Karen Kaplan. Uh, Karen Kaplan is affiliated faculty in cultural studies and science and technology studies. Uh, she's also affiliated with the Humanities Innovation Lab, the Mellon Research Initiative in Digital Cultures, and the IFHA Research Cluster on Gamification. Karen's research investigates technology, cultural geography, and visual studies, uh, along with many other themes. She's the author of Questions of Travel, Postmodern Discourses of Displacement, and many articles on her new project on aerial perception, GPS, drones, and we'll hear some of that today. She's also co-author of numerous collected volumes, including Between Woman and Nation, Nationalisms, Transnational Feminisms in the State, Lesbian Rule, Cultural Criticism and the Value of Desire, and Terrorist Assemblages, Homo Nationalism in Queer Times. So her talk today is The Mind's Eye in Motion, Aerial Views. Thank you, Ellen. Um, gosh, I wish I had written Lesbian Rules, but I, I didn't. Um, uh, but I, I guess I'll, 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 I'll claim it and then see if taunting results. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, thank you. I want to thank the organizers, um, in particular Joe and Brad and everyone involved, and thank you, Victoria, for such great organization. Um, uh, and Ron Mangan, of course, um, everybody who helped fund this. Um, so um, I'm here to represent the humanities, I guess. Um, I work across the humanities and the um, qualitative social sciences. One of the simple ways uh, to describe the project I'm working on uh, is to say that I'm writing a cultural history of aerial views. I'm interested in views from above, um, the new modes of perception that the invention of the airplane made possible. But I'm also interested in what I could learn about viewing itself. I see this project as a way uh, to inquire into the cultural history of sight, uh, how it works across uh, modernity, uh, even why uh, it is that vision seems to be the most important sense in this kind of study as opposed to hearing or touch or smell. It turns out that inquiring into the emergence of aerial views opens up many avenues of study, way too many for one book as it turns out. Uh, and what I would like to do in the few minutes that I have today is describe the arc of the project and reflect especially on the interdisciplinary methodology that I use in a project like this one, something uh, Joe prompted us to um, think about and to um, develop in our comments today. Uh, I think of the way that I work as uh, the construction of a large jigsaw puzzle, one of those irritating puzzles that always seems to have a piece or two missing by the time you seem to be getting towards the end. Um, but like most scholars, uh, I like puzzles, uh, and the pieces that are missing lead me into the most important, challenging, and interesting parts of the project. In this case, I'm drawing together materials from fields like art history, cultural geography, military history, as well as visual culture, post-colonial, and science and technology studies to try to understand how each of these fields has engaged the issue of perception or sensing uh, in relation to landscape or terrain. Putting my coffee down and hoping it doesn't spill here. The military history uh, and technology piece of this is tied to the origin of my interest in new information, so-called new information technologies that are now not so new, <clears throat> that were used in the first Persian Gulf War in the early 1990s, and the innovations in target visualization and navigation that were linked to that moment uh, in the so-called revolution in military affairs. My work has taken me to the U.S. National Archives, the British Library, and the Imperial War Museum in London, but often I'm able to do a lot of my research at home in my study, where I am very happily surrounded by piles of books, far too many hard copies of articles, uh, as well as zillions of digital files. I work with books, scholarly and journalistic articles, images, and maps. Um, this is not an ethnographic project. Uh, nor is it a project that proceeds through close textual analysis. 
I think of the process in which I work as one based on collecting and layering. I place accounts and examples from different fields, disciplines, and practices out on an imaginary table. I have a big table. I try to place things on it, but right now it's piled with books. Uh, so I play on an imaginary table, and I begin stacking or layering things that seem to me to have points of contiguity. I'm sure that there's some snazzy software out there um, that would help me move this process out of my imagination and intuition into something highly efficient and productive based on really accurate algorithms. But so far, my process involves a lot of mulling and thinking, uh, trying out various connections and configurations. What I'm looking for in this process, I guess, is the place where my overlapping pieces can't quite fit together where something needs to be imagined, something else needs to be imagined, to be researched, to be questioned at the very least. I'm looking for uncertainty. I court uncertainty. Here's an example. Uh, in order to pursue this project, um, I had to study the history of the rise of air war in World War I in depth. Uh, and in the process, I gathered lots of different historical accounts of the birth of aviation and its incorporation into military strategy and tactics. And I began to notice some key patterns and primary narratives, as well as some significant gaps and points of misconnection. When you think of air war in World War I, what do you think of right off the bat? Air war, not the trenches. Red back, right, thank you, very good. Flying aces. The daredevil pilots uh, who flew in flimsy machines, machine gunning each other into flaming death spirals. Um, this was indeed the first major war in which combat was conducted in the air, usually plane to plane. Although militaries could imagine aerial bombardment, the planes were not yet well equipped to drop bombs accurately or in great numbers. So the aces of the Western Front dominate accounts of the air war of World War I. There's also a significant literature on the development of reconnaissance photography in World War I, also focusing almost exclusively on the Western Front. But there were other arenas uh, during World War I. Uh, there was an Eastern Front, of course, uh, and there were what uh, were and continue to be euphemistically uh, referred to as the sideshows, a huge zone stretching from North Africa up through Mesopotamia. Naive reader that I was at first, I had to assume that perhaps airplanes were only used in Western Europe. But the histories of World War I, uh, in the histories of World War I, in the so-called sideshows, there was ample evidence that airplanes were used extensively, not only to attack each other, plane to plane, but to conduct aerial reconnaissance throughout the war, just as they were on the Western Front. Not only that, as soon as the war formally concluded, the British decided to use air control, as they called it, as a primary means of cheaply and efficiently managing a population that did not welcome their presence, uniformly anyway. Uh, British air control during the man interwar mandate period in locations such as Mesopotamia or Palestine included enormous amounts of aerial reconnaissance. And former pilots who returned to their pursuits and disciplines such as archaeology and urban planning called for greater integration of the new field of aerial photography into their work. So actually aviation and the collection of data from the air in uh, the so-called sideshow regions um, was, if possible, even more extensive than in Western Europe. These uh, returning pilots uh, argued in professional talks and publications that the airspace and terrain of the Middle East was the perfect laboratory for the development of the fields of photogrammetry and other arts and sciences of aerial and remote sensing. Thus, not only was aerial photography and air war a huge part of the story of World War I in the Middle East and North Africa, it was a large part of the story of the interwar period as well. So why is this information absent from or only briefly mentioned in most English language histories of air power in World War I? And if I had a whole scads of undergraduate research assistants, I would ask them to compile uh, uh, and uh, produce um, data sets about uh, just exactly how many sentences or little short paragraphs that refer to um, what I've just talked about um, in the main, um, uh, main and even subsidiary um, histories of air war in World War I. One of my primary fields uh, is post-colonial studies. So the discrepancy in histories that I'm talking about really just jumped out at me. It's so curiously obvious. 
uh, it was calling to me from my imaginary table of layered accounts. Pay attention. So I've been paying attention. I don't think it's just that there are two sets of historians, uh, historians of Western Europe on one side and historians of the Middle East on the other who are respectfully observing regional boundaries uh, in their accounts and politely not treading on each other's, on each other's projects. Um, the disconnection of uh, these stories goes beyond the national or regional dividing lines of international area studies, I think. Because what happens when you put the stories together? You have to tell World War I differently. You have to bring the Ottoman Empire all the way into the center of the story. And you have to open up your um, idea of Europe in new ways. Uh, in addition to the terrible toll of trench warfare on the Western Front, you have to acknowledge and write about the huge numbers of soldiers from India who were shipped to Mesopotamia to fight for Britain, only to die in droves from disease and starvation due to the mismanagement, due to mismanagement that was so egregious, it resulted in court martials and a um, very major parliamentary review. Why is the Indian Army's Mesopotamian campaign, a side note, separated from the mainstream narratives of trenches and flying aces on the Western Front? What results when you split the storyline of World War I then into a primary Western European stream and fashion the sideshows into tiny tributaries? In just one way, you have a very oddly skewed history of air power um, and aerial sensing, which um, I, you know, just historically should probably be corrected. Uh, so how does this example translate into a book project on aerial views? I'm, I suppose that the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which are morphing and moving into new dynamics in the current moment, strongly motivate me uh, to frame my project as an inquiry into U.S. historical amnesia about the ways in which colonial relations permeate contemporary conflicts. Yet, although I'm often writing articles or giving talks about very recent iterations of aerial viewing and sensing, especially in relation to drones these days, my book takes a different tack. I'm trying to understand the ways in which aerial views have emerged through a series of transitional practices in the modern period from the late 18th century to the first decades of the 20th. As I've immersed myself in histories of aviation and air war, as well as aerial imaging, a powerful set of patterns emerge there as well, uh, drawing me continually back to this earlier era. I noticed a repetition across fields of a few key pivotal inventions or events. For example, almost all studies, regardless of field, state with great certainty that Western culture was transformed by the possibility of new views from the air. Um, the new views that uh, uh, were only, uh, that became um, realized through the invention of aerostation, ballooning in the late 18th century. And this, transform this transformative innovation was only heightened once uh, uh, photography was um, added to uh, the uh, imaginative possibilities of ballooning. Uh, with, and there's always a brief reference um, in these works to the great French photographer Félix uh, Tournachon, also known as Nadar, who is an avid aerialist and who's credited with the achievement of taking the first photograph from the air. This is actually a whole thing we could talk about. It's not really clear that that really happened. Um, the dates are often mixed up in the histories. 19, uh, 1858 and 1868 are uh, mixed up, and it's possible things were, that were taken by his son. Or it's it's interesting, but I won't. We can talk about it later. In this storyline, uh, the next stage in the production of our modern worldview is the combination of the airplane and the camera, um, creating the perfect weapon as well as the ultimate realization of the mind's eye in motion. For example, the French writer Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who perished in a plane crash near the end of World War II, wrote this uh, kind of passage that we uh, find in, in uh, many of these works. The airplane has unveiled for us the true face of the earth. We set our course for distant destinations, and then, only from the height of our rectilinear trajectories, do we discover the essential foundation, the fundament of rock and sand and salt, in which here and there, and from time to time, life, like a little moss in the crevices of ruins, has risked precarious existence. In this beautifully evocative passage, we find all of the elements of the discourse of aerial views in the modern period. 
The view from very high above reveals a fundamental truth, a ground truth, uh, that cannot be perceived at any other scale. And this fundamental ground truth um, uh, holds profound value for humanity, for all humanity. There are hundreds if not thousands of passages like this one written in the 20th century across numerous fields and disciplines. And again, if I had that little army, uh, I, I, I could marshal a better uh, account. I, but you, so you just have to trust me. I became curious about the uniformity and similarity of these accounts. I decided to go back to the early histories and texts related to the first balloon flights. What did people say they saw? I mean, really. Is it the same thing? Are we, would I hear the same thing? Did anyone produce images based on these sites in the late 18th century? This idea to spend a, just a little time, just a moment looking into early aerostation sent me into a process that took about four years and led me, <laughs> and led me to write a first chapter uh, on, on the first balloon flights and a second chapter um, on the first panoramic paintings. I was inspired by a little line and an accompanying quote on the very first page of Beaumont Newell's classic work from 1969, and this is a, a text that is uh, always uh, referred to uh, in any work on aerial views, airborne camera, the world from the air and outer space. Newell was the first curator of photography at the Museum of Modern Art, and this work, as I said, is heavily cited and considered to be one of the first serious histories of aerial imagery published in English. Newell begins his book with a short chapter on balloon flights and establishes the contemporary terms of the discourse of aerial views, explaining that although people had created images uh, of the ground as if from the air, uh, like this uh, uh, well-known uh, bird's eye view uh, of Venice, um, those bird's eye views, he argues, remain earthbound. They, they're imaginary. They show the land seen from great heights, he tells us, but not from points suspended in space. Therefore, these imaginary bird's eye views remain uh, familiar and easily legible. Uh, they are, in fact, uh, projections and not um, accurate, uh, scientific, uh, scientifically observed um, uh, imagery. Newell tells us that the first views from balloons were sublime. Um, amazing and intriguing aerial viewers. And tucked away in this discussion is one line. The appearance of the world from the air was often entirely different from what had been expected. Huh. I think my thought process at the time uh, was something like this. So we've come to believe that the view from the air is the best form of observation and that photography has given us this tool. Um, the combination of flight and photography has given us a tool for the best possible, most accurate uh, forms of observation. Uh, observation that can be used for many scientific and military pursuits. And we've developed an aesthetic uh, appreciation for these kinds of panoramic uh, views. Part of the appeal of the aerial view is the belief that it can provide uh, total accuracy, uh, absolute clarity, and perfect precision. Yet at first, people were not sure what they were seeing when they looked out from the gondola of a balloon. Therefore, in the first chapter of my book, I engaged the evidence from the first years of aerostation that suggests that viewing from above was not at all naturally masterful. In fact, people were confused, uh, disturbed as much as elated, or factually informed by views from the air. If the mind's eye in the Western tradition was able to create legible representations of the earth from above in the form of uh, bird's eye view prints, the new ethos of scientific observation and realism strained the representational capacities of late 18th century Western European aerialists. Thus, uh, Thomas Baldwin used four separate perspectives uh, to try to convey the visual experience of flight. He published his work, Aeropaedia, in 1786, only three years after the first so-called manned balloon launches um, took place. And the four illustrations in his book are believed to be the first images in print based on sketches made by a human being in flight. Baldwin spends a lot of time in his book trying to explain just how weird it is to see anything from the air. He points not only to the kind of distort distorted flattening effect that we expect from vertical vantage points, but also to bizarre shifts in color. And if we had more time, I would go through the, each of his uh, images and explain his um, textual efforts to try to 
uh, help his readers make sense of what he's trying to convey in the images as well. But uh, rivers are not blue, they're red, uh, everything is the wrong color, uh, et cetera. Um, and to the fascinating but perplexing properties of viewing through clouds. Spending time with these images from Aeropaedia changed my project. I became interested in how these four views became drawn together over time into what we now would uh, uh, assume is one universally recognized view from above, uh, and when and how this happened. Uh, so if we fly in an airplane and look out the window, we think we know what we're seeing. Um, this was not necessarily um, um, the experience, um, and not just based on Baldwin, but many other um, published accounts and unpublished accounts from the time period. I ended up uh, writing the second chapter of my book about the mode of viewing produced by the first panoramic paintings in the late 1780s. These images were created as immersive entertainment, uh, commercial immersive entertainment, by uh, the artist Robert Barker, who was desperately looking for a way to make money. Um, e they were either cityscapes or battle scenes rendered in realistic detail, and viewers would enter a specially constructed rotunda through a dark passageway and emerge onto a platform that could afford them uh, a view at just the angle um, they would achieve if they were in the first minute of a balloon launch. This is not just my fanciful association. Um, the circular, oblique, elevated view uh, directly referenced balloon flights, and there's a lot of um, uh, evidence that um, but not only Barker, but um, other people involved in panoramic installations were intensely interested in uh, aerostation and um, uh, were, try in fact, trying to replicate um, the 360-degree view uh, that you would achieve from a balloon flight for people who couldn't go in a balloon. Um, the word, uh, before the word panorama was coined, which happens only some years after this, Barker advertised his invention as the coup d'oeil. I try to think through the concept of the coup d'oeil in the third chapter of my book as I explore the ways in which aerial views became incorporated into early earth sciences, such as geology and geography, focusing specifically on the first military surveys of the mid-18th century and what became the British Ordnance Survey. And I don't have time to talk about this very much, and I just gave a talk on campus much greater length about the first military survey of Scotland in 1746. Um, so I'll move through this quickly, but uh, as the French term coup d'oeil moved into English usage in the 18th century, this literal striking of the eye came to refer to any glance taking in a general view. Uh, I think that keeping the military provenance of the term in mind uh, helps us to remember the entangled nature of military and civilian surveying and mapping as nation states embarked on infrastructural projects, building road systems, rail lines, and developing global communication systems, whether it was in late 18th century Scotland in order to put down the Jacobite rebellion, or in India, or in Africa, or in the American colonies, etc. To see all at a glance does connote mastery and control by the air uh, in, in this um, history becomes a major motif uh, through the 19th century and into the 20th. We tend to think of air power or air control as proceeding through aerial bombardment, but it's really the operations of viewing from above that structure the powers of the age of aviation. The extension of this power of observation to satellites and even more remote forms of sensing seems to epitomize the teleological nth degree of the God's eye view. But once again, I want to caution us about embracing this generalized discourse of aerial mastery through sight. And I'll just take a moment to talk about the, what I'm hoping is the last chapter of my book, or the last chapter and a half, maybe, uh, uh, before I conclude my comments. Um, in this, um, towards the end, therefore, of, my, of this project I've been working on for so long, I explore the emergence of analog reconnaissance photography in World War I and its aftermath as a continuation of the, practices of, of the practice of surveying that had been developed from the late 18th century and throughout the 19th. The links between the large-scale ordnance survey projects and the kind of systematic mapping from the air developed during World War I is something I'm still working on. Um, there were surveyors who insisted that mapping was only accurate if measuring was conducted on the ground. And there are huge debates and scientific uh, meetings and papers uh, from the time period in which this argument uh, 
unravels, un unrolls rather. But there's also uh, an avant-garde who argued that aerial surveying could be just as accurate and perhaps even more precise if operations and equipment could be standardized. European archaeologists who were interested in Middle Eastern sites of study played a major role in the post-war development of aerial surveying and photography in the region. Mesopotamia and neighboring regions were enthusiastically promoted by this vanguard uh, in ordnance and military surveying communities as the perfect space for testing photographic and aviation technologies, especially in relation to surveying, planning, and cartography for a mixture of state, military, civil, and commercial purposes. Aerial topographical surveying was not the only innovation tested in the ideal zone of Mesopotamian airspace. Techniques of bombardment were also practiced and perfected during the mandate period in locations such as Mesopotamia. Uh, beyond accuracy and efficiency, the primary lesson learned from this form of air control was one of morale. Although air control promised perfection of performance, in practice, things often went wrong. Uh, visibility could be a problem, and pilots could become disoriented. Targets were completely missed, and with enough warning, the enemy had little trouble evading the supposedly omniscient sight of the airplane observers, not unlike conditions today. Yet in such an unbalanced fight, the aerial strafing and bombardment had a huge impact on the emotional as well as the physical state of the population on the ground. As Priya Sacha argues, at the accuracy issue was moot. Aircraft was, were presumed to be always already overhead, creating a moral effect of surveillance and for most compliance. Thus, terror was the, scheme, uh, the scheme's underlying principle, achieved through interference with its victims' daily lives, through destruction of homes, villages, fuel, crops, and livestock. Aerial peacekeeping, peacekeeping heavily in quotes, then as now, was a violent, uh, a violent enterprise um, not only of observation, but of um, continual presence. Entire villages were bombed for general recalcitrance, refusal to submit to government, and for harboring wanted rebel leaders. The advantage for the British of an investment in air control was the proliferation of more accurate maps and surveys of a region due for significant industrial development by oil companies, geopolitical stability, and um, a somewhat subdued population. I began these comments by saying that the simplest description of my project is that it's a cultural history of aerial views in the era of human flight, and that this project gives me an opportunity to inquire into the dominance of vision in Western culture. My emphasis is on a variety of military visual technologies, but only to demonstrate how the deep integration of military practices, objects, and habits of being structure everyday life far from the fields of battle, recognizable in arts and sciences of all kinds. Since most imagery is remotely captured, the distance between the observer and the observed is believed to confer a kind of buffer to feeling, even to lend a scientific objectivity to the process of viewing from above. We feel less because we're farther away, uh, as, according to that argument. Uh, but what I've learned from this project is that the space between observer and observed is a conduit of connection. Uh, the act of image capture or creation is never neutral, and that there are innumerable variations and versions of some of our most iconic events that require, if they cannot be reproduced or recovered without further evidence uh, of, uh, and further violence, recognition of the possibility of their existence or their pasts and futures. The story of air power and its many ways of seeing raises as many questions as it answers. That's the kind of training that I have. Uh, as the, I'm getting to an answer, I am failing. I really have to keep searching to um, uh, destabilize that certainty and move back into uncertainty in order to keep inquiring. Perhaps the most important missing pieces in the jigsaw puzzle of my project are all of the other senses, besides or beyond vision. I'm leaving places for those pieces uh, as reminders uh, that no account is ever definitive or final. Thank you. <laughs>